Pakistan is seen internationally as a failed state for its militancy and links to terrorism. But internally, it is poor governance that has plagued its people for decades, leading to corruption, energy shortages and a plummeting economy. There's a Chinese proverb, fish rots from the top. If your cabinet and your prime minister are honest, half your problems are solved from day one. With a history of military coups here, no civilian government has served out their term in office. Fear of martial law is always there when there is bad governance in the country. The current administration is locked in a different power struggle with the judiciary and a resurgent opposition. Most of the cases which are against our party leadership, including President Zardari, they are fabricated cases. I'm Drew Ambrose. On this edition of 101 East, we ask just where is Pakistan headed? Mile by mile, Pakistan is a land of contrasts. In its manicured capital, Islamabad, a new political landscape is shaping the lives of its 190 million people. All year, the eyes of the nation have been transfixed on an unfolding drama. The Supreme Court has summoned Prime Minister Raja Pervez Ashraf on charges of contempt for not pursuing corruption cases against President Asif Ali Zadari. The PM and his Pakistan People's Party have agreed in principle to reopen the case. If he doesn't, the court could dismiss Ashraf as they did his predecessor, Yusuf Raza Galani. Analyst Tariq Pazada has been monitoring the case from the start. Will the government just put another Prime Minister forward and another Prime Minister? What On is the face of it, it seems very likely that that will happen, but there may be a fallout. Is this a healthy political situation? As far as the rule of law is concerned, the answer is a resounding yes. There could be fallouts of all the things that happen in the world. There could be some political damage in the country, but so be it. Among Islamabad's iconic mosques, mansions and monuments, the Supreme Court is leading a democratic transition in a nation where the army has ruled for half of Pakistan's 65-year history. If you take away, if you tear down this one institution, the whole uh, you know, edifice of democracy will come tumbling down. The Supreme Court has become a barrier in the way of these major politicians who violate the laws every day, who threaten uh, different classes of society, take away the rights of the people. President Zardari is accused of embezzling more than $10 million in kickbacks using Swiss banks during his wife Benazir Bhutto's reign as Prime Minister. That corruption case and thousands of others were dropped in 2007 through an amnesty law with the ruling military, allowing Bhutto to contest elections after a period in self-exile. But she was assassinated soon after. Public sympathy contributed to her party's win with her husband at the reins. Two years ago, the Supreme Court ruled the amnesty law illegal and wants Zardari's case reopened. Former international cricketer turned opposition politician Imran Khan agrees. So this is the first time we are seeing a Supreme Court trying to bring the powerful under the rule of law. And what you're seeing is the People's Party trying to destroy the Supreme Court because they're scared that once the probe starts into the president's corruption, then they're all in line next. When the last military regime that ruled Pakistan sacked prominent judges, the judiciary responded with lawyers' strikes. It led to the resignation of then-president Pervez Musharraf. The Supreme Court has since pursued powerful security agencies for human rights abuses in rulings described as judicial activism. They have come forward and attended the courts. And if somebody has crossed the line into something unlawful, 
judiciary has a right to pass a judgment. Hamid Nawaz Khan was a career officer in Pakistan's army, serving as the interior minister under Musharraf. Military coups have occurred here three times, but given the new strength of the judiciary, he believes it won't happen again. This fear even now is within the masses that look, we should not cross those lines where military gets the chance again to take over. And judiciary categorically is saying that we will not let it happen, we will not provide any support. So that way it is emerging as, as, as a pillar uh, of power. At the National Parliament, an emerging free press can grill politicians with ease. Yasmin Rahman from the ruling Pakistan People's Party is concerned about the vengeful nature of judicial activism. I would say that uh, judicial activism has suddenly been very, very strong and selective justice is being done against Pakistan People's Party because there are hundreds and thousands of cases of common man lying in Supreme Courts and High Courts also and there are cases uh, relating to other parties' uh, leadership also. But we don't see that sort of active uh, pursuance of those cases as we see uh, the cases regarding the Pakistan People's Party. We expect our judiciary to be transparent, to be impartial and to be above all these politics. Political analysts like Sahail Mahmood believe the Supreme Court makes politicised judgments and at times oversteps its boundaries. The judiciary, the Supreme Court, I mean, starts to decide matters that is not in its purview, like economic matters, like petroleum prices, sugar prices, that is not for. That is not the prerogative of the judiciary. Uh, you know, it is best to leave these economic matters to the market. The Supreme Court have been selective. Their anger is more towards the Pakistan People's Party. But remember, I mean, there is no doubt in anyone's uh, mind that this is a very corrupt government. Analysts say corruption has corroded all sectors of society, including the justice system itself. In the lower courts of major cities, boutique law firms sell their services like merchants. Those seeking justice face a complex bureaucracy, rife with bribes and long waits lasting years, says local court lawyer Malik Arshad. If I was your client, what sort of problems would I face in the lower court? So many problems. First, you entered, when you entered in the court, court, court premises, you will face the middleman. He will get a bribe to send to a proper advocate, a proper lawyer. Uh, then the court officers, not judges, the court officers, they are the main source of corruption. If you want to uh, get a date to linger on your case, you g just give him 500 rupees. That's why the case is lingering on and lingering on to one year and two years, three years. Malik works in Rawal Pindi a major garrison city adjoining the capital. He says a shortage of government officials and a backlog of cases create the culture of bribing to navigate the system. The legal system should be judged when you are providing justice to any layman. The lower system, lower lo uh, legal system is not uh, as good as the Supreme Court is doing. Frustrated by endemic corruption, more and more young professionals are taken to the streets. At this rally, doctors are pushing for better working conditions and wages from the government. Things are going to get worse before they get better. Pakistan has become uncomfortable. People are angry, there's a rage in Pakistan against the status quo. And this rage is translating into support for Imran Khan. Imran Khan is the only member of his party in parliament. But lately, the opposition leader has attracted large rallies in major cities and claims his party has 10 million members. With national elections next year, many believe he could add a new dimension to Pakistan's power struggle. Pakistan today is fighting for its existence. This country is now on a genuine crossroads. Unless we reform, we are gone. An energy crisis here has sparked job cuts and riots. There's not enough electricity or gas 
to meet demand, causing chronic load shedding. These scheduled daily blackouts grind Pakistan's lucrative textile industry to a halt. This factory, due to very serious kind of load shedding, we faced. Uh, Wahid Ramey shows me one of his three factories in Faisalabad. Faisalabad is Pakistan's third larger city, once known as the Manchester of Asia for its thriving textiles industry. Now, a third of the machines lie unused. How do you feel when you look at the machines, you know, just sitting there? How do you feel even coming in here? Uh, I, my heart cries. Because this was a working and very lively place, I come very happily here and this was the future of my kids. I invested millions of rupees in this place. And this is not my story, this is the story of hundreds of people. There are so many people who have lost... Like many factory owners, Wahid market. is thinking about selling out Those and markets. operating overseas. We don't have much faith remained on our rulers because they have given us so many promises that they will then load shedding will end this year load shedding will end that year but with the passage of time after every two months i would say that we face 10 to 16 hours daily load shedding many of our government groups they have shifted to bangladesh that is why our business community is thinking very seriously that they should uh, shift their units to other countries. Workers around Faisalabad tell me they don't get enough shifts. 50,000 are unemployed and don't have alternate skills. It's a story that plays out across the entire Punjab province. According to the local Chamber of Commerce, more than one million workers have been laid off in the last two years. A few industries have closed down already, they've gone bankrupt. Few are at the verge of collapse. They will be probably in this year or probably next year. They will be just gone, out, vanished, because the government is not supporting. The banks are not being flexible. They are charging full markup. If they would just, you know, give a bailout package to this dying industry, probably they would be saved by by next year, probably. But if they won't, and if they would keep on this stiff uh, policies, uh, you know, half of it would just out. Textiles contribute almost 8.5% to the country's GDP. But due to load shedding, the best performing factories work at half capacity. It's not affordable to run all of it. So they keep 40% of the part closed and 60% running. So overall, what this thing has done is uh, it, it is government uh, statistics that I'm telling you, a 6% decrease in the total exports of Pakistan this year. And it is, uh, if you really calculate it, you know, uh, it's like more than a billion dollars. Furthermore, Faisalabad's only power plant was closed by the government. It's old, but with proper maintenance, the power plant could provide 30% of the city's energy needs. Old power plants are kept non-running and new rented power plants are being imported. And that happened like in, in every major city, four, five, six power plants were imported but since the cost of erecting, installing and running was too much, the government didn't have the money and they asked for the local uh, uh, industry and the businessmen to, to, to put their share in. Uh, you know, keeping in view the past performance of the government, no one came to help. Punjab state is a power base for the country's main opposition party, the Pakistan Muslim League, Nawaz. They say the current government has failed to create new energy projects and owe independent power companies over three billion dollars, forcing them to slash production. Instead of resolving the circular debt issue, billions of rupees were given to these rental power companies to produce electricity and they kept sitting on this money for three years and they did not do anything and it was a very expensive electricity which the country could not afford but mostly they brought second-hand equipment which was discarded in other uh, countries and they were based on very low efficiency and the cost of production or cost of generation of electricity was very high. The country could not afford and as a result they remained idle. The current Prime Minister was a Minister of Power during this time. His critics accuse him of receiving kickbacks 
for importing costly but ineffective rental power stations. Pakistani power stations are running at 20 to 25 per cent capacity, but industry officials say load shedding can be fixed within two years if addressed properly. But as more and more people crowd into urban centres, pressure to keep up with energy demands increases as well. Despite $280 million this year in foreign aid to address power shortages, Pakistanis maintain it's a bigger problem than terrorism. It's not just factories that are affected by Pakistan's energy crisis. Small businesses in big cities like Lahore and villages around Pakistan can endure up to 16 hours of load shedding. But take a look around this corner and hear the noise. These are power generators and they're a common sight in Pakistan. They're keeping businesses going through these dark times. But one in 10 Pakistanis can't afford a generator. This is a typical evening for Taylor Iftikhar Nisa. He stopped using electric power tools three years ago. What can I do? We don't have electricity and we have to complete our orders. We cannot use motors because we have 10 to 12 hours of load shedding a day. Sometimes there's 10 minutes of light, then an hour of darkness. It makes me very angry. His shop in Lahore's back alleys converts and sells handle-operated sewing machines. But with the poor economy and high prices, not many customers come to buy such luxury items. People don't have buying power. I don't have much work now. I live in a small house. My parents live with me. I'm worried about how I can buy amenities for them. The energy crisis is just one factor in Pakistan's unravelling economy. Last year, Pakistan's fiscal deficit reached an all-time high and foreign investments fell nearly 40%. Government has, as a result, resorted to massive borrowing. And this massive borrowing of government is also fueling uh, inflation in the country. So we have to cut down on the wasteful expenditure. We have to focus on the real issues to make our productive sectors produce. We have to create an incentive and environment where private sector can come in and restart the engine of growth. Uh, government has had no economic vision. We have seen four finance ministers come and go uh, during this government. Back in parliament, members of the ruling Pakistan People's Party blame the energy and economic woes on Pakistan's last military leader, Pervez Musharraf. This garbage is, for the last about nine and a half years, remnants of the dictatorship. That is why it will take some time to remove all of this. Showing me around his new neighbourhood, Political analyst Tariq Pazada says standards of living are improving. The problem is only 2% of the population pays taxes. People don't pay taxes in this country. They believe that they can get away with that or they have this false belief that everything will be misappropriated by the state and they won't get anything in return. The culture of paying the taxes does not exist. As a result, resources to improve the welfare for poor communities are scarce. In Karachi, street seller Atik has 10 children. They have to help with his work rather than go to school. It's a critical time in Pakistan for poor people. People always worry about how they're going to eat the next day. The government needs policies that address poverty. I want them to leave Pakistan. They're thieves. They're corrupt. Only new blood can improve Pakistan's economy. A rising crime rate has cemented Karachi's reputation as a violent city. Atik believes economic distress is the underlying cause. Because of unemployment, people are resorting to stealing mobile phones and cars. Some people even kill for money. When we go outside to the market, we don't know if we'll come back home or not. Crime in Karachi has increased because of economic problems. 
Karachi, as Pakistan's largest city, generates half of the country's wealth. The big urban centres, with a growing middle class of 80 million people, are seen as agents of change. The structure of Pakistani society is changing. Because of industrialization, because of urbanization, because of education, this emerging middle class is the force for change. They are very aware of what is happening. So we have to now reach out. I think any future government would have to have a much more inclusive governance. And I think uh, therefore the role and challenge of any future government has become uh, very complex that they have to deliver with speed. We meet lawyer Malika Shan again. He, like many young Pakistanis, feels disillusioned with the current government. He says that's why many of his friends support new voices like Imran Khan. But Malik has some reservations about Khan's anti-corruption stance. The Imran Khan stance is uh, so much uh, idealistic type of a stance. When you uh, see the history of Pakistan, uh, these kind of Imran Khan type leaders always emerge after 10 to 15 years. They have a slogan of change in, in the society. But in Pakistan, the, the political system and the political institutions are so much complicated. Imran Khan is adamant he can eradicate government corruption within 90 days if put into power next year. Massive corruption is always by the government, uh, by the Prime Minister and the Ministers. We have the biggest crooks running the country today. Not surprising, Pakistan has gone bankrupt. So honesty is the number one criterion. Uh, number two, there must be checks, uh, uh, checks and balances to the government by an independent body. And what we are doing, which has never been done before, all the cabinet will disclose the assets which will go on our website. This is one of the biggest deterrents to corruption. Despite Imran Khan's popularity with disenchanted middle classes, political pundit Sahail Mahmood says his reluctance to work with established parties is a big disadvantage. He, of course, uh, don't, doesn't understand the situation of the, uh, regarding the global war on terror also. He is uh, very anti-American, anti-Western, you know, speaking against the USA, speaking against the NATO all the time. I mean, too naive. Too naive and the fact of the matter is he doesn't have any experience of being in government. Political satire is a popular way for the middle classes to cope with tough times. Muslim League noon ke senator In this seemingly conservative nation, no political topic is out of bounds for satirist Sahail Ahmad. <laughs> How do you make issues that are a bit black like drones or load shedding funny? I created a skit in my show where drones became obsolete in the future. The Taliban pick them up and sell them on the streets as if they're a new rocket launcher. They call out like hawkers. Take the drones, take the drones. Such satire would not be possible a decade ago. A sign of political progression. Our media is now strong and free. We can show problems on the screen in seconds. That's why the situation is getting better. But to solve actual problems, democracy needs to prevail. We've never seen the result of democracy in this country. People hate the politicians who've ruled, but they've never had the chance to complete their terms. Let them finish, and we'll decide who's good and who's bad. Many politicians use astrologists to predict their destiny and help them deal with problems in office. But those pushing for change say Pakistan's fortunes lie in better governance. The reason why the army has played such a disproportionate role in Pakistani politics, which is why it has moved in and taken over so many times, is because of the political bankruptcy. We have politicians who come in and start plundering the country. They do not have the moral authority to tell the army to behave itself. Once you lose the moral authority, they have the physical authority. Pakistan's changing civil society and political landscape is pressuring a government already facing a myriad of problems. Elections expected next year will be a key turning point as the nation develops. <laughs>